Hallelujah. A very good evening to everybody. Hallelujah. Can we just close our eyes for a minute? We're just singing, Lord, here I'm thirsting in my soul. And you are the bread of life. And only you can feed my quench, my thirst. Come, Lord Jesus, and fill our thirst this evening. As we are gathered here, Lord, we are the eaglets. And we learned a month back, Lord, that just as an eagle stirs up a nest, and the stirring of the nest is not to kill the eaglet, the stirring of the nest is to make the eaglet strong. Because the space where the eaglet is right now is too small to the plan that God has for the eaglet to fly and soar like an eagle. Father, this evening as we are gathered here, we, you have given us these two days, wonderful days to listen to your word. Feed us with your spiritual milk, O oh Lord, as a mother feeds the baby with the milk, nourishes, nurses the baby, the baby sucks the milk and that milk makes the baby strong and grow and bring forth a tremendous change in the baby's life. In the same way, Lord, this evening as we are gathered here, you are a loving daddy and we ask of you, Lord, that in these two days, teach us, O oh Lord, your ways, your truths, so that each one of us will experience that abundant life that Jesus came to give us. We thank you and we praise you, Father, for all these great and mighty blessings that are in store for us this evening. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So, uh, I think uh, two months back we had learned about the eagles. And there was not much time. So, we learned a few points about the eagles that Eagles always fly with eagles. They don't fly with other birds. Then we also learn that eagles fly on high. They don't fly low, they fly high. Then we learn that eagles have got a great vision, a great sight, that they can focus from even five kilometers distance the prey and go for it and catch the prey. Praise God. So there were some things, that, then we learned that eagle doesn't eat any dead things. It eats live things. It doesn't eat anything dirty. Praise God. So as we were learning about those eagles, there is one great thing that happens in an eagle's life is that when it reaches an age of 40 years, the eagle has to make a great choice in its life. And that's what we see in Isaiah, in Isaiah 40, was, uh, let's start with 28. Has thou not known, has thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary, there is no searching of his understanding. The creator neither gets tired or is fainting or his understanding is beyond imagination. He is a God full of wisdom. His ways are not our ways. His plans are not our plans. And it is this God who gives power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increases strength. Say that might. Say that again, might. The word might means the ability to get victory. The, the word might means the ability to get success. So God is the one who gives you the power. Power for what? Power in your everyday life that under pressure and under stress, you don't faint. You are still strong. And he gives you his ability and his might so that... He increases our strength. Yes, we too have our natural abilities. But when God gives his might, his might gives us victory in every area of our life. And that's why you find uh, the heroes in the Bible. They were filled with might. For example, Samson. When the spirit of might came upon him, 
he would go all by himself and finish the whole army. That's might. In, and each one of us in our everyday life, we need God's strength and might. And then see what he says. Even the youth shall, even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagle. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So he's saying even the youth, when the pressure comes, they cannot take the pressure and they will faint. The young man shall utterly fall with their own wisdom and understanding. The decisions that they make, which is contradicting to God's word, will lead them into uh, a path of destruction. But those who wait on the Lord, now that word wait on the Lord does not mean you do nothing. Waiting on the Lord means waiting with patience, but at the same time focused on the promises of God. A person cannot wait on the Lord without the promises of God. In other words, the person is, is, is waiting patiently on those promises that God has given him the assurance that he will bring it to pass. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So that person, that wait is called trusting in the Lord. Trusting is totally relying, totally confident, totally depending on what God's word says. And when you do that, he says, you shall renew, they shall renew their strength. Now, the same thing happens in the life of an eagle because God has compared man to an eagle. When the eagle reaches an age of 40, a, 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 a decision has to be made because at the age of 40, the same wings which once upon a time carried the eagle so high up in the sky, those same wings have become grown up and the weight of the wings is so much that the, that the eagle cannot carry, uh, the wings can no longer carry the eagle to that height. That same wings have now become a burden. The feathers have become, have become so heavy that it cannot flap its wings. The talents, which once upon a time, when it would focus on the prey and go down and, and hold it in its claws, in its talons, those nails would pierce the prey and 80% of the life of that prey would be dead, would be, would be lost by the, by the grip of that eagle. And, and the finishing line would be the eagle with its beak would kill the prey and then eat it as a food. So the same talents which was once upon a time used for hunting and helping the eagle has now become useless because the nails have grown so big that they are bent now and there's no more grip. It cannot catch the prey anymore. And the very beak by which the eagle would once upon a time use it to attack, now the beak has grown so much that it has become a curve that it cannot use anymore for hunting. And this is what happens in the life of an eagle. It cannot fly when it reaches the age of 40. The feathers cannot carry it anymore. The talons can no longer catch its prey. And the beak, which was once upon a time useful, is now in a, in a situation that it cannot pick, um, um, attack the prey. And every eagle goes through a choice in its life. And the choice is it has to, with its own free will, pluck out every feather from its body. And that process is extremely painful for the eagle. That same eagle has to break his beak on the rock. He has to go on hitting the beak on the rock. It's painful. And he has to break the beak till a new beak is formed. And with the new beak, break every one of his talons. And it's bleeding, it's painful. Till the new nails, the new talons are formed. And the whole process goes on for 150 days. 
And in this 150 days, the eagle cannot fly. This 150 days, the eagle cannot go for any more hunting. These 150 days is the days of near fasting and only being on the, on the top of the cliff, protecting himself, waiting for the new things to develop in it. And when the new beak comes, the new talents come, the new feathers come, once again the eagle gets into the current of the wind and this time the eagle flies for the next 30 years. But if the eagle thinks that I do not want to go through all this pain, then that eagle, which cannot fly, is now an easy prey for the enemy. That same eagle who says, I don't want to go through this process, can no longer fly. It can no longer hunt. It can no longer live. It will die slowly, but surely in starvation. And that's what God is saying to each one of us. We were born. We were born through our mother's womb. But something had happened when we were born. God who created Adam and Eve, created himself, created them in his likeness and image. He created them perfect and he created them to live forever. God never created sickness or disease. He created us to live forever. And he created us like eagles that we would always be with him in his presence, filled with his glory and live in his presence all the days of our life. God created the Garden of Eden and he gave man the power and might that man would use his power and might to reproduce. Reproduce not only children but reproduce the Garden of Eden all around this earth. That was God's original plan, the garden. And praise be to God. God who loved gave everything to man. And there was only one thing that God said, I do not want you to eat of this fruit. Man made a decision to rebel against God by disobeying God and obeying the devil. And that's when sin entered into us, curse entered into us, and everything got messed up. And that's when destruction came into our life. And that's why we are born in this world, not in the likeness and image that God had originally created, but now we are born in this world in the corruption of sin, in the power of sin, in the power of selfishness, and we have been living this life of sin all throughout till one day we got to make that decision to make Jesus the Lord of our life. Praise the Lord. Every person gets a chance when somebody comes and preaches the gospel to that person. And that's the time a person makes that choice. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I want you to think about the day you made that decision. Praise God. Somebody preached to you the word of God. So what happened when the gospel is preached? That is what we are going to learn. And we are going to see that each one of us are created to be as an eagle. But down the line, because of that corruption that took place, we lost everything. But praise be to God, Jesus came to restore all those things. And praise be to God, each one of us, without an exception, has been given the same choice, the same freedom. And now, when we make a choice to renew our strength by trusting and waiting on the Lord, praise be to God, each one of us will begin to fly like an eagle with the strength and ability of God, which is not possible with our own ability, but only with the ability of God. Amen? Hallelujah. So, it is God's original plan for each one of us to live in his presence and to live a life of love. And what kind of love? Agape love. And what is this agape love? My friends, 
everyone seated here without an exception when we were born we were born for one reason god created us for only one reason you know why god created uh, adam and eve only for one reason that he would pour his love into adam and eve and adam and eve together would pour that same god's love into all creation that was god's original plan and what is agape love agape love is a love that's unconditional agape love is a love which is which is selfless love see every love in we, do we do we have relationship love anybody married come on anybody married yes in marriage or any relationship our love is going to depend on performance if my performance is not good in that relationship my love will turn into a negative emotion and instead of love i will be bitter i will be hurt and i will be walking in hatred is it right come on even in a relationship when when you come to a relationship of friends the same a relationship of parents and children the same so every kind of love that we have is a human love or a love based on emotions a love based on myself you do good to me i love you you comfort me i love you you do what i want i love you but when you do things that i don't like i don't love you but when it comes to god his love is not based on our performance his love is based on his decision that whether you love me or not whether you are walking in sin or not i still love you and that's why the word of god says god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son he loved the world what is that world that world symbolizes the intensity of sin extreme extreme hostile rebellious power that's what he says among among the whole human race in sin extreme sin and god loved the sinner that he gave his only son and now what happened this same agape love god has poured into everyone when does a person receive this love just just put romans chapter 5 uh, let's we start with romans chapter 4 verse 25 and then we come to verse 1 because it's a continuation last was last was shall we all read it please jesus that that who is jesus jesus was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification what does that word mean he was delivered he was on purpose on intention on god's plan and purpose and will he was nailed on the cross with god's will and he was nailed on the cross because when man committed sin when man disobeyed that disobedience brought a curse upon the whole human race in the same way when jesus with his own obedience with his own free will took up place as a substitute praise be to god through him the curse is destroyed amen so in other words one man disobeyed the whole human race came under the power of sin another man obeyed and the whole human race has now come under the power of righteousness or under the power of god can we give the lord a big hand of for that <laughs> hallelujah <laughs> hallelujah so when jesus died he did not die our death he he did not die his death because he committed no sin but jesus died our death he died for us as a substitute he could have never died because he committed no sin and when he died our death he, he only qualified to die because only the person who commits sin dies so he took our sin upon himself and that's why he could qualify death and because he died praise god he died our death and because he had committed no sin god raised him from the dead praise god praise god just as god raised jesus from the dead because of committing no sin in the same way through jesus you and i 
are dead to sin and we receive this new life through Jesus, through our baptism in Jesus, just as God raised Jesus from the dead, in the same way God makes us righteous through Jesus. Just put that 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 5, 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 21. Listen, my friends, you got to believe the scriptures and then you will experience that life to fly like an eagle. How many of you want to fly like an eagle? A life where you are overcoming your situations and your problems in life. Praise God. Okay, here we go. For God made him, God has made him to be sin for us. Now, now, how can, how can you look at Jesus, a sinner? He, he, he did not commit sin. He did not commit sin. But he was, he was made. See, so listen, listen, listen. When Adam disobeyed God, he was not made a sinner. He became a sinner. Are you following? But you and I did not become a sinner. We were made a sinner. How were we made a sinner? We were made a sinner when Adam became a sinner. Through Adam, every child that was born was born in corruption. And that's why we were made a sinner from a mother's womb. Are you following? Are you following? So just as God by his power, through his mercy, took all our sins... And through that sin, he, he, and he took all our sins and put it upon Jesus and made him to be sin who knew no sin. So he took all our sin and put it on him and he became a substitute on that cross. So through Jesus now, see what he says, who knew no sin, that we might be, that we might become or made. See, when it is become, you are doing it with your strength. But when you are made, it's not your strength. It's God's strength. It's God's power that has made you what? Righteous. Means what? When you stand before God, there is no condemnation. There is no guilt feeling. Because God has put his nature in you. Praise God. And this is a gift from God. And this change takes place when a person receives Jesus as his Lord God and Savior. When the person begins to believe uh, the gospel, the good news, and what's the good news? The good news is there is forgiveness of sin. The good news is that Jesus became your substitute. The good news is that Jesus died, he was buried, but praise be to God, he conquered grave, he conquered death, and he rose again because he was sinless. That's the good news. And the good news is, when you believe in him, just as he was raised from the dead, you too are raised from your corruption and God gives you a new life. Come on, give the Lord a big hand. Just put the previous, previous verse. Did you get that? Go to again 25. Jesus was delivered for offenses and was raised again for a justification. Justification means what? Your case has been tried and you are found not guilty. Why are you not found guilty? I am found not guilty because the blood of Jesus has cleansed me from every sin that I repented and confessed. So when the, when the judge looks at you, he says, I cannot see any sin because the blood of Jesus does not cover the sin. The blood of Jesus erases every sin. But in the Old Testament, when the animal sacrifice was, was offered, the blood of that animal only covered the sin but never erased the sin. Are you following? Are you following? So you and I are justified, declared not guilty as if you have never sinned in your life through the blood of Jesus. Can we give the Lord a big hand for that? Come on. <laughs> Hallelujah. Just put uh, chapter 5 verse 1. Therefore, being, being, now, now do you know what, what, are you justified? Hello, are you justified through Jesus? Yes. And you are justified by what? By your works or by faith in Jesus? So, being justified by faith, we have what? We have what? 
See, we could never have peace with God because we were in sin. Sin separates us from God. Hallelujah. 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 But when God dealt with that sin through Jesus and he broke that sin, that barrier, that separation through the sinless blood of Jesus, when he was crucified and he died, even the curtain that separated God in the temple, the Holy of Holies, there was a curtain that blocked the Holy of Holies. The curtain was torn from the top to the bottom and the separation was over and God now has peace with man and man has peace with God because Jesus is the mediator between God and man and through him we have peace with God. Say that peace with God. Peace with God. Say that again. Peace with God. Say that again. Peace with God. Say that again. There's difference between peace with God and there's a difference between peace of God. Every Christian who is born again, every Christian who has made Jesus the Lord of his life, every Christian who believes that Jesus is his Savior has peace with God. But not every Christian has peace of God. What is peace of God? Put Philippians 4, chapter 4. We have learnt it before. I'll just read it through and then we go ahead. What is peace of God? Philippians 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. So you are rejoicing in the Lord means rejoicing in his word. You are not rejoicing based on circumstances. You are not rejoicing based on what people do to you. You are, not based, you are not rejoicing on your relationship with one another, but you are rejoicing because you have a relationship with God and His Word. Amen? And He's saying rejoice in the Lord. And we are rejoicing in our spouse. Okay. Let your moderation be known unto all men that Lord is at hand. Means what? When you are rejoicing in the Lord, even in the midst of your suffering, even in the midst of the negative things that are happening to you, the people around you, when they see what's happening, uh, they will begin to question, hey, how can you have so much of joy even in the midst of all this suffering? That's the, that's the presence of God. That's where your mind is stayed on God and his word. That's when they, they, you experience that God is with you. And then he says, be careful for nothing. In other words, do not be anxious. Do not be worried. Worried is when a person is imagining of things which are negative. That's not happened. That's not a real. That's, that might be uh, not even real. And it's a threat that the person is thinking. It, it, it might not even happen. But the person is focused on those negative things. He is getting into worry. So he's saying, do not be anxious of anything. But in everything, say that in everything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God and the peace. So who are the Christians who will experience peace of God? If you go to a preacher or to a pastor and you say, come on, lay your hands and let me get some peace. You don't get peace through laying of hands. You don't get peace through somebody praying for you. You get peace when your focus is not on your situation, but your focus is on God and his word. And, you have, and the situations that you are giving, coming against you, you have handed over those situations to God. Hallelujah. And that's what he says. Let, and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding shall keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Where do you get attacked? You get attacked in your heart and in your mind. Through what? through issues, through comments, through really different negative relationships, that uh, negative things that happen in relationships. And now you're broken and the peace is gone. The peace is gone into pieces. Praise God. Hallelujah. How, how many of you want to keep your peace all the time? Or you want to be in peace when you come for the service and when you go out and you get the first call and the peace is gone for, into pieces? How many of you main, want to maintain peace all the time? All of you? Just follow verse number 8. Look what he says. 
Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, things are true are the things that is the word of God. True. Whatsoever things are honest, whatever things are, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue or if there be any praise, don't think on these things. Which one are you thinking? Ask your neighbor. The whole day, are you thinking verse number 8 or are you thinking contradicting to verse number 8? So in other words, he's saying, you mean to say, brother, if I have got a bad situation, I don't think about it? You know what God is saying? When you got a bad situation, hand over that bad situation to me because I never created man to handle bad situations. I created man to, I created man to love. I created man to handle only good things. It was that disobedience that brought the bad things. And you are not created to handle those bad things. You, that's why you hand over those bad things to me and now keep focusing on the good things that I have done in your life. And I continue to promise in your life. Amen. 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 Which one do we meditate more of all the good things that God has done or the bad things around you? So now what are you going to do? I want you to just think about your eyes. There are so many who do not even have eyes. Just try out. Close your eyes and walk from one room to the other. Just try. How much are you going to praise God now? Come on. There are so many good things that we need to praise God and thank God and start focusing on those good things. Praise be to God. Everything in your life will begin to change. Your mind will begin to change. Praise God. Let's go back to Romans chapter 5. So now do you understand peace with God? Okay, just, just, just wait, just wait, just wait. Now there is something called peace with God. We just now learned peace of God. And the third thing, God of peace. How many of you want God of peace to be with you? How many of you want God of peace to be with you? Now watch how the God of peace will be with you. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me. What's that word? What's that word? Touch your neighbor and say that word loudly. Let the neighbor hear it. Huh? 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 Do. Do. Do what? What you have learned, what you have received, what you have heard, what you have seen, in the Lord, huh? which one we are doing? We are champions in praising God. We are champions in praying. We are champions in fasting. But we fail in doing. And he's saying, when you do, who will be with you? So if you want God a peace, does he come by praying only? Praying will ask, uh, prayer, praying will tell, you, uh, will give God a chance to intervene in your life. But ultimately, it's your decision, how, what are you going to do? Because your doing is going, to, uh, is going to decide your destination. Hallelujah. Touch your neighbor and tell him again, do. How, uh, how many of you have realized in your life, that when you made decisions which were contradicting to God's word, it was an easy way out, it was a shortest way, or it was a, some kind of temptation, and you did exactly contradicting to the word of God, and, you, and, and when you did that, it opened a new, uh, new venture or new project of misery. Have you seen that? Come on, has it happened to you? Come on. So, your past experience, what is it showing? The score. When you disobey God, does it bring more chaos and more misery in your life? But now, if you start following the word of God, will it bring the goodness of God into manifestation? Yes, yes. Praise God. Let's go back to Romans. So, now you have peace with God? Come on, do you have peace with God? Every Christian has peace with God. But does every Christian have peace of God? 
So how does peace of God comes? When your mind is stayed on God. When your mind is stayed on His word. Now peace of God is the strength. It's a shield that will quench every fiery dart of the enemy. When peace walks in, joy walks in along with peace. Peace and joy, they go together. They are twin brothers. And when there is peace and joy, there is strength, there is ability of God to give you the victory. Ability of God to overcome temptation. Ability of God to fight and take the kingdom of God by force. Amen.